Any ceasefire will come too late for many here. Most of Chernihiv already destroyed. Tens of thousands of residents of Chernihiv suffered punishing conditions with little food, water, or power. One of the hardest hit places in Ukraine is the northern city of Chernihiv. Amnesty International says an airstrike in early March involved at least eight unguided bombs that indiscriminately hit civilians. The city played a key role in preventing Russian troops from advancing into the capital, Kyiv. Russia has since retreated from the area. We, as the Redemptors, have been in Chernihiv since even during the Soviet Union. One of our fathers was working there back when the church was still in the underground. Till today, we continue that same mission of evangelizing and working with those who are most abandoned, most forgotten, trying to find those little niches in society that no one wants to go there and going there and being with those people. And so we've had a monastery there. As long as Ukraine has been free, there has been an official monastery almost right away in Chernihiv. Well, the siege happened almost right away. Um, no one could have foreseen that. In morning, rush across the border. By night, the city was almost surrounded. Ukraine wasn't ready for what had hap what would happen. No one was ready for the scale that they went in with. And so it kind of started before anyone noticed. And for 40 days straight, Chernihiv was surrounded, being attacked on from different sides, from in different ways. And just the stories they have of people trying to get out. Uh, one of the things targeted was, of course, the bridges. There became less and less ways to get out of the city. Uh, even one family uh, of our parishioners said that they thought to get out, then they decided to stay, then it started getting worse, and they thought to get out again. Because at that point, it was really, is it safer to risk the road, or is it safer to stay here? Because, of course, it's safer somewhere else, but how safe is the way out of here? And then right as they were getting ready to leave, the last bridge was taken out and no one could leave anymore. But even before that, when there was one bridge left, uh, Father Roman showed me just where there was a line of cars across the whole city to get out. And just imagining you're in a line of cars city long, trying to get out with usually older people or people who couldn't travel because the people who could go on foot had run out already. And time to time, a plane flies by and just shoots at the bridge you're crossing on or drops a bomb nearby. And you never know when it's going to hit and when it's going to miss. And yet you're standing in line immobile because of the amount of people trying to get out. You know, of course, as with any siege, all the typical situations started happening with uh, utilities going down. And then slowly water became an issue and eventually food. I mean, there was one point where I called Father Roman from Frankis and I said, what can I do? And he says, I don't have time right now. Look up online, Google Chernihiv, Find every supermarket you can and call them. I have tons of money. People have given us money. I have nowhere to buy anything. And I spent the whole day on the phone. Not a single one of the markets was open. When those bridges got taken out, it just wasn't just people couldn't get out. Supplies couldn't be brought in. We've been there through Father Ihor was there during the underground where even being a priest was an arrestable offense. And so the war changed nothing with this. Our, our confers who were there stayed there with the people and no one left. In fact, we even more people tried to get in to help there and stayed there to help the locals, to support them however they could. And in those days, it was really uh, talking with our conference there. 
it was different things. I mean, some of our confers uh, decided to live at the church just so it could stay open, just so people had somewhere to come when they needed that place, where they needed to just be able to go there and feel feel normal for a moment, to feel that connection with God, to feel, I won't say peace, because I don't think at a time like that anyone feels peace, but a little bit calmer, a little bit more at peace for a moment at least. The people living with us was a situation that just naturally grew. People started leaving, mostly our parishioners, they started saying, you know, we're going, but let's say we live on the fifth floor of an apartment building and there's this old lady that lives next door who can't leave and she can't really go down the stairs. Can you help her? And so slowly we started, Father Ramon started getting more and more people he was kind of taking care of. And at some point it just became impossible to go out to them. And so slowly they started coming in and the more they started coming in, the more other people who were in ruined houses and so forth saw that there was a place to go and just naturally a group gathered that needed a place to live. There was a basement and we could centralize people to kind of bring supplies together. There was a way to kind of feel safe. I won't say be safe because we're all aware that it was a basement, it wasn't a bomb shelter. God forbid a bomb fell, that wouldn't necessarily have saved anyone. But being together, feeling that support, being with others who were facing the same thing, there was that feeling of safety. These people, despite what they were going through, despite their own hardships and crises that they were having in their lives, they put in the effort to support each other, to help someone else who was maybe a little worse off. And the way these people came together almost as a family it's incredibly moving to see how that happened. And that allowed the fathers to, again, do other work, not only focusing on the people there, but knowing that they're in a safe place, relatively, considering the situation, to further go out and help others as well. Father Roman had a whole long list of shut-ins, which he, for some of them, he was their only connection now that people were leaving the city and organize supplies and also again with that palliative care a very strong connection to the hospital uh, a very strong connection to the staff that stayed which was very limited especially since a lot of people live beyond the city who work in it and at that time couldn't get through and to the patients who didn't have the option to evacuate no matter how much they perhaps wanted to and then of course with just people in in those worst hit off areas just everything we had that we could give away was being driven there and who needs what. What can you take? And uh, what Father Roman says, it was, a, it was a rush job. You pack the car, you get it there. Often there's bombings going on even while you're driving. You get there, you get as many people as you can and you divide it as well as you can. What they need, they take. What they don't, they leave and then you drive out because the longer they're together, in a group, the bigger target you're making. Bobrovica is a part of the city, uh, a borough of the city, which right now almost doesn't exist. There were actual tank battles in, this, in that part of the city. And these people had none because their electricity was cut, the gas was gone, there was no water. One of the neighbors had a, had a well, which we got permission to use. We broke down the fence so we wouldn't have to go around because it was dangerous. They went in, filled up big uh, cast or, well, just big plastic containers and would bring it there. And when I asked them about when they'd bring it, they said, well, there was a, to keep it safe, they had to bring it at the same time, just so people would know when to gather because they didn't want to get, start gathering people and keep them there for a long time. So people knew when they were coming with the water. And the question was, well, what if they were being bombed at that time? And they said, well, what if that didn't change anything? Because that's when they were expecting. One of the things I was able to take part in while I was there was 
uh, Father Roman decided to organize the summer camp, which happens every year. And he decided that it would happen this year as well. And at first we thought that we were hesitant and thought that maybe we'd get a lot of pushback from the parents, but the amount of joy we found from them when they heard about this. And looking back, you can understand that. I mean, they had been stuck in basements with their children for 40 days. Their kids are surrounded by all this destruction and chaos. Anything that could distract those kids is a good thing. Anything that could bring some sort of happiness to them or show them something else is positive. And the parents were just so happy. And of course, you know, some would ask, what do we do if there's some sort of air raid? And of course, we told them what type of shelter we have, how we could hide in there. But I just even remember one of the parents saying that, and two of the other parents who heard that turn up and go, if anything happens, keep them with you, okay? They're safest with you. They need to have to know other people are going through this. They need to see each other and to know that other kids are feeling what I'm feeling. But when you see them playing together and then something happens and they all get kind of tense. And then when you see them come together, hold each other, hug each other, and then go back to playing, kind of keeping each other in the line of sight, you, you understand how important it is for them at that base level to feel that safety in numbers, to feel that safety of each other, that support of each other, that human contact. Seeing these kids smile, who some of them hadn't smiled in a long time, it was truly moving. And in those smiles, you can just see that hope doesn't die, that it goes on. I want to say thank you uh, from me and from all of us who lived here, for who uh, prayed for us, who supported us, and who didn't forgive us here in Ukraine and in Romania. Тому, що однакові здані, а 